This is an interview with uh, Dr. Alan Cagliaros, Professor of Nanoscience at the College of Nanoscale Science and Engineering. Now I'm going to read a little bit of your uh, thing. He's Senior Vice President and Chief Executive Officer, College of Nanoscience, Nanoscale Science and Engineering, CNSE, of the University at Albany, SUNY. Vice President, Special Advisor to the President, University-wide Economic Innovation and Outreach. So, uh, Dr. Italianos, where did you grow up? I grew up in uh, Beirut, Lebanon. So, growing up in Beirut, Lebanon, and how did that upbringing, upbringing that help you to formulate who you are today? No, I like, there were two main experiences that I think have shaped some degree one of my, what I am today. The first is growing up there in high school, the emphasis is very different from you. You have to accept, you have sure. to be the best in science and math, mm -hmm. and if you're not, you cannot become one of the non-cool kids, which is the reverse of high school here. I have a 16 year old and an 18 year old. The 18 year old is now coming into his element, but earlier, he always thought that you know, science was the new thing, it wasn't a cool thing to do. Uh, so that's one piece of it. The other piece is the war, the civil war. Sure. Having witnessed the peace of the civil war and all the atrocities that come with it and all the uh, death and destruction, it, it gives you a special appreciation for life. I was there um, before the civil war. I usually consulted in the Middle East. Mm -hmm. and I what was years? In, in, well, years like 75 to 83. Mm -hmm. um, we, I still, uh, they still want me to consult there, but that's mm -hmm. another story, um, another planet. 75 was still in the Paris in the It was, and there, I mean, Beirut, I mean, you look across and, you know, and it's, it was beautiful, mm -hmm. and, and it was a paradise. And obviously the war it just tore it apart. So you, you left Beirut and you came here. Now, you could have gone to anywhere with your, your, your marks, your education. Why did you choose to come to America? Uh, actually, I was looking after I got my what's called the Sanstal Cinema, which is the equivalent of a master's okay. from the French system to the English system. Yes. Uh, I wanted to go for a doctorate. Mm -hmm. And most of my friends wanted to go to France because we grew up in the French educational system. Yes. Mm -hmm. We learned French, our degrees are in French. So they went to France to do the Doctorat d'État, which is kind of like a PhD here, plus about five to 10 years. Mm -hmm. You want to make sure you're completely dead before you get to <laughs> You don't make um, much money along the way, but you have a good education. I was fascinated with the American system. I okay. grew up with Apollo. I grew up with all the American innovation. Sure. I grew up with the excitement of, you know, even the French. I yes. mean, if they could be the U.S., they would. So uh, I, I applied to go for a PhD in physics in the U.S. And at the time, I went first to Santa Ana University, the University of Miami. Davis, Florida, okay. because they were admitting students between uh, for the spring semester. And I spent a year and a half there. It reminded me to some degree of Davis, because that was also at the time when Fidel Castro sent. Oh, the Cubans, the, what, the, the refugees and young. the prisoners, sure. Um, and then I went to the University of Illinois for my PhD, mm -hmm. top 10. And you know, it's an amazing university. I got, I took my transistor course with the professor who invented the transistor part in. It was amazing. That is amazing. The other amazing thing was leaving Miami, and it's 105, January 6, and humidity a million percent. Landing at O'Hare, <laughs> and the pilot coming on the intercom and saying, I do apologize, it's minus 40 wind chill. The thing gets stuck. <laughs> it can't come out <laughs> of the plane. <laughs> so we're gonna have to go down the stairs, go in. Oh, it, I got quenched. It, it, it's it's a different planet, but that's yeah. I mean, that, that's what makes America great. We have the diversity, Absolutely. Yeah. and and you can go anywhere you want to. And and now, once you had your degree, okay, you started um, teaching, okay, and the teaching aspect is, is is that's academic. You're not an academic. What kind of part of me is an academic? Well, I like to think of it more as a scientist. Yes. Uh, the culture I grew up in at the University of the, what's called the materials research lab mm -hmm. is emphasis on research and funding. Okay. And the teaching is part of that culture. Sure. It's not primarily classroom teaching 
as much as teaching students how to innovate, how to create things. And so uh, professors become advisors. And we teach groups of students how to become innovators, thinkers, how to acquire analytical tools. So within that environment, uh, I learned the importance of creating a uh, similar environment for innovation. Kind of like, you have to be the best in this field and create the best program to be able to compete long term. Mm -hmm. Plus, I noticed, I saw what they did to my advisor when he decided to branch out in another field that wasn't within the mission of the materials research lab. He wanted to go into uh, artifacts and history and examine them and kind of like determine their age composition. Sure. Which is an interest of, in order to be successful in this business, it's big science. It's like big corporations. Yes. You have to build an empire to have the freedom to go back and pick those areas that you personally want to enjoy doing research in. And you've done that. Well, we're in the process. There is never an end. <laughs> but think of, okay, but coming from Beirut, could you have ever imagined that you'd be sitting here now, the President of the United States comes to visit you. You are sitting here on one of, you've created this. Now, I know you, you, you've surrounded yourself with excellent people, and you have inspired people to come from all over the world, corporations to de develop here and spend billions of dollars. How do you think that has come about through your simple beginning to where you are today? Uh, you know, it's a, it's a mixture of things uh, from persistence, goodwill, uh, strong work, stubbornness, mm -hmm. uh, how to make business deals, how to create an environment where all the participants get what they want, how to make offers that you can't refuse. The timing of the offer, not in the in the <laughs> mafia way. You know the difference between the Italian mafia and the Scottish you don't have mafia. A, so what's his head in the the, yeah, yeah. the the Italian mafia makes you an offer you can't refuse. The Scottish mafia makes you an offer you can't understand. <laughs> uh, meaning opportunities that people value that they get interested in, and you do it gradually because you know if on day one. Any of us, so you went to the capital and said, we're going to create the biggest industry university, innovation hub in the U.S., and we're going to generate $14 billion, give us a billion dollars. They probably would have left us out of New York. They would. And no, not the U.S. Yeah. And luck, I mean, there is a point where luck helps by other people's inaction. And timing. And timing. And location. Um, my colleague, way more senior than me, who I interacted with at MIT, his name is Rafael Bright. He was the head of all the microelectronics programs um, when we started microelectronics here. And we had to work together in 1998 on a joint uh, national consortium at MIT, Stanford, Cornell, Georgia Tech, Harvard, Yale, and Sony Albany. Mm -hmm. And they would stutter with the name at first. You understand yeah, what Sony is Sony Albany? Yeah. Right, right. Uh, the best drinking capital of the world, right? You know? Exactly. Right, right. He was just appointed president of MIT. But three years ago, he told me, and I quote, you son of a bitch, you guys beat us in Nano by three years. They formed committees. Sure. Faculty spent their time studying it. By the time they were done, what we did was the business of academics create accountability within the academic system, have individuals make decisions and be held accountable for it, from me down, which is unheard of in the academic environment. So you went towards a concept of business within academia. academia. Absolutely. And now, as you develop that, and you brought all these companies together, it, it wasn't automatic. They weren't falling over each other to come here. You had to negotiate, you had to administer it, you had mm -hmm. to develop it, build it, construct it, and look, now you're building a whole other new facility. And manage it. I mean, it's, it's a relationship that you have to continue uh, managing and nurturing with all the companies. Of course. Because with any new company coming in, the others feel threatened, and so you have to pay them attention. Kind of like 
more kids coming in. Mm -hmm. And yes. you have to treat all the kids equally. The walls, I think there is one behind us here, glass wall that separates the lamp space from the Tokyo electron space. Two competing major mm -hmm. equipment companies. There is another one in that facility, glass, that separates Tokyo Electron, there stays there from applied materials. Mm -hmm. Applied is the largest, 10 billion. That is the second largest, about 8, 9 billion a year. Okay. That wall when we built in the facility took six months of negotiations because they wanted the old dock. They didn't want one to know the other. the other. But you, and you've overcome that. Exactly. By showing them that in this open innovation model, you still can have a glass wall and you still can treat them both in the Switzerland model equally. Mm -hmm. And even if one of them looks across the world to the other side, they can't tell what the other side is processing. And we're not going to leave to the other side what they're doing. Mm -hmm. And so through a combination of uh, them building their confidence that we're going to reach Switzerland, it's a level playing field that they're both going to be treated equally. And what I call the carrot and carrot approach. Uh, and you know, money talks. Money does talk. And without carrot, money, it doesn't happen. And the carrot and carrot approach means, as opposed to using carrot and stick, use the carrot. But depends, you know, whether you want to use it as an incentive in the mouth or something.